Holy crap, that part moved. Wow, I can't believe that worked. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. It's a very exciting day on the steam engine today. We're going to be working on the cylinder casting. This is the most complex casting on the engine. Lots and lots of tricky operations, high drama. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. Let's go. I've marked one end of the casting and that's the end that goes against the frame. That's the important end. I'm going to machine this using the Keith Appleton method, which is very clever, very easy, and very precise and I screwed it up. So as you watch what I ended up doing, I'll also be describing how you should do it. Now I'm cleaning up the casting here with files and a Dremel. The first step in the Keith method is to clean up the inside of the bore a little bit. The whole key to boring a cylinder casting is that everything has to be aligned to the bore, except that the bore is a rough casting. So how do we find what the center axis of that casting should be? Step one of the Keith Appleton method is to make a mandrel that fits inside the casting. And what that does is averages out the error in that bore. People often ask me if I follow Keith Appleton, and to that I say, of course. The second rule of YouTube machinist school is to follow all the Keiths, Appleton, Rucker, and Fenner. And on Adam, and Tom, and Robin, on Stefan, and Tony, and... Oh wait, it's a little bit early for this joke. All right, in a couple of months, that's gonna be hilarious. Oh, and the first rule of YouTube Machinist School is that you don't talk about YouTube Machinist School. So I'm turning down this piece of scrap here, and whoo, it's getting pretty hot. I let it cool down before doing the final test fit. And it's difficult to measure the bore, so really all you can do is get it close and do a bunch of test fitting until it goes in. And unfortunately, I overshot a little bit. That fit is a little looser than I would like, but we can deal with that here in a minute. I'm parting off a little bit far from the chuck here, so I have the tail support in there for most of this operation. And then as I get close to the end, I pull it out. And, oh, I ran out of room. Mm, couldn't quite get in there with the parting blade all the way, so manual Yahtzee. Now I can set up the casting, so I'm clamping it relatively loosely in the four jaw chuck, and then I insert the mandrel that we turned. I've got a shim on there to take up the extra space because I turned it a little bit undersized. Again, that was a trial and error process, so it was really easy to overshoot it. I'm also setting some copper shims under the jaws because the irregular shape of the casting there makes it a little bit difficult to get a good grip on. Now the first really clever bit of the Keith Appleton method is you can just dial in on that mandrel that we turned. One important note here, remember how I marked the important end of the casting? The end that has to be really, really square because it mounts against the frame of the engine? That should be outwards when you do this operation. Yeah, I did that wrong and that's going to come back to bite me later. Nevertheless, I bring up the largest boring bar that I have and we can start boring this thing out. Now, of course, there's scale there to chisel our way through, but that's par for the course with the casting. After each pass, I'm actually flipping the feed direction and I'm power feeding it both ways. Because there's a lot of deflection on this boring bar, it makes it easier to ensure that I get a straight bore that's going to be on dimension. Once you have a cleanup pass all the way down, here comes the really clever bit of the Keith method, and that's that you use the boring bar to face the end of the cylinder. And now you've got virtually guaranteed a perfectly square interface between the bore axis and the face of that cylinder where it's going to mount on the engine. And that's going to guarantee that your bore is running true with the axis of the engine. I absolutely love this trick. It's so simple and so effective. And now we can go ahead and enlarge the bore to the final desired dimension. As long as we don't touch that face and don't move anything, we're going to end up perfectly square. This boring is slow going because you're taking light cuts and slow feed to keep everything nice and straight and well that takes a lot of time so you pass that time how you want, I'm going to pass it how I want. The nominal dimension that I'm aiming for here is one King James thumb and I'm trying to land one thou under that so that I'll have room for honing. So that looks good, we're exactly one thou under there. The tolerance on this dimension is zero under and two thou over, so I may end up honing one and a half thou out of that, something like that. And I'm also going to break that edge, but I'm not going to chamfer it because I don't want to mess up the seating of the cylinder head on there. Just got to break that sharp corner. Next, I flipped it over and seated that machine face up against the chuck face, and I figured now it would be pretty easy to just face the other end. However, this doesn't really work very well. Tapping it in is pretty ineffective because of the rough, irregular shaped casting, and the part can't move in the jaws, so it stays fairly crooked. Now, I decided to face it off anyway, thinking, well, this is the outboard end, so it doesn't actually matter if it's a little bit crooked because there's just an outboard head sitting on there. 
I hadn't yet realized my mistake. Okay, so at this point I had created a bunch of problems that all could have been avoided. You recall that I had squared up the other end using the Keith Appleton method, so that end was very, very square. However, it was the wrong end, and I also didn't face it down to the correct dimension. I actually forgot to do that. I just faced it off, cleaned it up, and then flipped the cylinder around. So now I've got the correct end, which is not very square, but set up to be faced down, and the good end, which is now in the wrong place and has to be faced down a bunch more, and as soon as I do that, it won't be perfectly square anymore. So I've got a whole bunch of problems with the end faces of this cylinder. How am I gonna fix this mess? I'm gonna buy my way out of this problem with a very trick piece of tooling. I'm setting up to turn between centers because I'm gonna use this expanding mandrel. These things are super cool. They have those fingers that ride on a taper and as you hammer them into place, the mandrel expands to fit the bore that you're trying to reference. So now I can turn this casting between centers and we're referencing the bore and I can reface this end here and actually face it down to the correct dimension. And this is the end that was in the chuck, which I didn't face down properly. So now this gives us a chance to face it down to the proper dimension while still keeping it really square to that bore. After that facing operation, you can see that this end of the cylinder is now nice and square. So we're within, you know, half a thou there of being square to the bore. So that's great. But we're not out of the woods yet. The other end is the one that was supposed to be the frame mounting end, and that was the one that was faced second. And so it's known to be running out quite a bit, as you can see here. We've got about eight thou of run out there. And the problem is, this is the end that mounts on the frame and thus sets the relationship between the bore axis and the engine axis. So if this cylinder is mounted 8 thou off, it means the bore is crooked by 8 thou, and that's going to affect how well the piston runs in there. So my plan was to face off this end now and square it up using the same setup. But as you can see, I don't have room to do that. The cylinder is already flush with the steam chest. There's literally nowhere to go here. I definitely don't have room to face. So what am I gonna do about this? Well, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the cylinder over on the frame. And what that's gonna do is make the steam chest stick out the other side of the engine compared to how it's supposed to be. I can get away with that because so far the entire engine is still symmetrical on its short axis, if you will. So, all this will mean is that all of my valve gear is going to move to the other side of the crankshaft, but the crankshaft and everything back there is all still symmetrical, so it really doesn't matter if the steam chest is sticking out the other side. It's going to tax my brain a little bit to keep track of the fact that my engine is now going to be a mirror of what's in the uh, diagram on the exploded view, but I think that's my best option because this end of the cylinder is just so nicely aligned with the bore, and the other end is such a mess that I just I don't want to try using that. Another option that I also considered was flipping the cylinder end for end, keeping the steam chest on the same side. The problem is that reverses the steam ports, which are asymmetrical. So it would put the exhaust on the bottom and the intake on top or vice versa. And I wasn't sure if that was a good idea. So I think flipping it left to right is safer. So with that bullet dodged, I can set up to machine the steam chest now. So over to the mill and I'm gonna set it up vertically here so that we can do all of the operations on the end of the steam chest. Got some copper in there and I'm using the indicator to make sure that the bore is horizontal because of course it's sitting on the casting. So I had to shim it a little bit, but a few shims and a lot of indicating later and we have it sitting level. Now I'm gonna square it up as best I can using the side of the casting there. And now I can clean up the edge of the steam chest and it's gonna give us our primary reference surface for the steam chest. Gonna be lots of vacuuming in this process. I did some depth sounding to get a sense of how much I need to remove in there to clean it up. And I'm gonna set up with a 3 8 end mill to machine the bottom flat first. And this is a little bit larger radius than might be desirable on the inside corners of the steam chest. But if I use a really small one and make those radii small, I'm gonna be here all day. So that looks pretty good. You can see I need to do a little more to clean it up. And then after a couple more passes, it's looking even better. So now I can machine the sides and there's no dimensions on any of this. There's nothing really precision here. So it's just about cleaning it all up. The valve is smaller than the steam chest and just floats inside on the valve rod. That's looking good now. The main challenge with this is just seeing what you're doing because when the end mill is in there, you can't see anything. 
And so the one dimension we do have to be mindful of is the depth. We're looking for 438. So we're at 439 there. I'm happy with that. It's going to be fine. And now I can set up to do the steam ports. So these are referenced from the ends of the cylinder bore. So I'm using a gauge block so that I can edge find on both of those sides and just use the half to get centered up. And then I centered up with the steam chest sides on the Y. And I just want to do a little sanity check again with the gauge block, make sure I've got enough meat there to drill down as far as I'm supposed to without punching through into the cylinder bore, because if that happens, then this casting is definitely scrap. That would be fatal. First port here is the exhaust, and it's the width of an end mill, so that's pretty easy. So I just work my way back and forth, slowly going down. I'm plunging down with the end mill here, so that's always a little dicey, but this two flute center cutting mill is doing well. And that looks really good. So there's the completed exhaust port. Next is the transfer ports that connect to the ends of the bore and transfer the steam over the valve. So for that, I had to go and buy this special end mill. This is a 3.30 seconds carbide end mill. And this is the exact width required by these ports. So it was the same process. It was slow, but uh, being careful, got the job done there. So those ports are looking good. These features were just uh, careful DRO watching, but you're flying on instruments because you can't see anything with the end mill down in there. Now, next we need to machine the boss here on the end for the valve rod packing gland. So since I have it set up here, I can side mill it and it'll be nice and square. Very easy to do in this setup. So there's no dimension on that, just clean it up. An interesting feature of this casting is that it has the boss for the valve rod on both ends and you're supposed to machine off the one that you don't use. And that's what gave us the option to flip this, the cylinder end for end before. But this is the one I'm not going to use, so I'm machining it off. And I had marked it red there, you may have noticed, so I didn't lose track of them. For the steam chest cover mounting, I placed it where it looked good aesthetically, and then clamped it in place and transfer punched the first hole. And then I decided to use the DRO to locate the other five, so I center drilled all five pretty lightly, just enough to make it clear where they're going to go. And then I put the cover back on and just did a visual inspection to make sure they're all going to land in the center. And then I did the tapping drill size for all six holes. Now for the tapping, this is a 540 tap. Again, pretty small, not the smallest thread on this project by a long shot, but still pretty small. So lots of care being taken here. This is cast iron, so I'm tapping it dry. quick deburr and let's see if that steam chest cover fits on there. It's a lot of little bolts to hold it down and that looks lovely. Very steam engine-y. That's all we can do from that setup so now on to the end for the cylinder head bolt pattern. So I centered it up with the coaxial bore gauge again and center drilled and drilled all of those holes to be tapped once again 540. This was pretty straightforward. After the coaxial indicator had been set up, then the rest of this was just all DRO magic. I did also sanity check that the holes were going to line up before finishing drilling all of them, just like I did with the steam chest, but it was much less of a concern here because the cylinder heads have a registration on them and they were also drilled with the DRO. The most important thing here is that the bolt pattern is clocked correctly. There has to be a hole at the 12 and 6 o'clock positions, otherwise they will interfere with the steam channels that we're going to be drilling later. Then rinse and repeat on the other side for the inboard head. Next the hole for the valve rod, which is referenced from the bottom edge of the steam chest, so I'm edge finding there. Here's a really interesting problem that I have just encountered. Using the DRO to locate the center of the boss here for the valve rod, look at that. It's not even close. Like that's off by, that's got to be 50 thou. So something is clearly wrong here. Now this hole is located from the bottom surface of the steam chest and that all checked out. Now the drawing shows a mill depth on the steam chest of 438 and I double checked I'm within a thousandth on that depth. So that's all good. So what's going on? Down here on the section view you see the 188 offset from the bottom surface of that steam chest to the center of that boss and that's the offset that I put in the DRO and you know we ended up way off. So what went wrong here? Well clearly the mistake is that this 438 depth measured from the edge of the steam chest is measured after having faced some arbitrary amount off of the casting which I clearly did not face enough off. So this edge here from which this measurement is taken on my casting is still too low. In fact, I measured it as about 40 thou off. So somehow I was supposed to know to mill 40 thou more off of that casting than I did. I basically just cleaned it up. 
How was I supposed to know that? I guess this dimension here, it's telling me I should have 250 from the floor of the steam chest to this center line. However, of course, this hole doesn't exist when you're doing that. So what you're, I guess, supposed to do is eyeball the center of this boss and then measure from that 188 down, face to that, then mill 438 deep, and then you will be 250 off the floor of the steam chest for this hole. So I don't feel the least bit bad about screwing this up because that's all super unclear that this that that's how this is supposed to work. There's never a dimension given anywhere for like how thick the casting is supposed to be in this area, any kind of guideline on how much you're supposed to face off, anything like that. Now the critical dimension really is this 250. The important thing is that the valve rod is a certain distance off the floor of the steam chest because that dictates the relationship between the valve rod and the valve. The valve is sliding on the floor of the steam chest and it's expected to be a certain distance below the center line of the rod. However, if I establish that 250 where, from where I am now, then this is so far off that the gland nut won't even sit even a little bit correct on this boss. I decided to go ahead and center the valve gland on that boss using a gauge pin here because no matter what else happens, this has to be properly positioned on this boss or nothing else is going to work. So. This I'm going to do and I will adapt everything else uh, to it. I started making plans for how I might modify the valve and that sort of thing. Now a clever part of this part on the drawing is that they use a drill to create a taper in the bottom of that gland packing area because a taper will help seal that uh, area better. So I set it with a 20 thou feeler gauge, moved the cool DRO down 20 thou so that I could get the exact depth so that the end of the drill taper would land in exactly the right place as specified on the drawing. And now that gland nut fits in there really nicely. You can see how there's a little taper in the bottom of that hole. Pretty cool. To line up the bolt holes, I centered up the packing nut with a gauge pin on the hole for the valve rod. And then I verified that the DRO was going to put them in the right place with another gauge pin. And it did. So I drill and tap those. And I blew out the chips with compressed air there because it's really important for such a small tap. These are 256 threads. So these are very, very small. Now to the steam intake port, and I decided to machine this boss flat, although the drawing doesn't specify doing that because I figure there's going to be a fitting on there and it'll seal better. Now the center of this boss is located from the uh, gland packing nut boss, so I edge found from there, moved over, drilled, center drilled, now I'm tapping this to size. And then of course a little uh, deeper there, and that's it for that. Now that all seemed to go well, but remember how the floor of my steam chest is too high because of those confusing dimensions? Well, look at that. The steam intake port has cut into the floor, so this is a problem. Now, this put a bullet in the heart of my vague ideas about maybe modifying the valve to work out with the higher steam chest floor, so there was nothing to it but to set it up again and remachine the floor of the steam chest and those steam ports deepen everything down to where they're supposed to be. So I set it up again in the vise using the shims to get the bore level and I squared it up with a square and an indicator and then I relocated the center steam port with a gauge pin and then I verified how much deeper it needs to go by putting a gauge pin through the valve rod port and just measuring from there because we have that dimension on the drawing and then it was just a case of going back in there with the same end mills I used before and deepening everything slightly. One interesting challenge here is that I was right at the limit of these small end mills for making these features that are way down at the bottom of the seam chest. This end mill here is held by like a quarter of an inch in that collet. It was a little dicey, but it did work if I took light cuts. Note that I didn't remachine the top edge of the steam chest because I would have had to re-drill and re-thread all the holes further down and that was a lot of trouble. Uh, for nothing really because this just means my steam chest is going to have a slightly larger volume than the design. Okay, so that is looking good. You can see the steam chest floor is mostly cleaned up there and my steam exhaust port lines up there. So that's all looking good. Now with the easy stuff done, it's time to do some plumbing. I need to drill the steam channels that connect the ends of the cylinder bore to the intake and exhaust ports. Now the drawing says if you set this up at 20 degrees, you're going to hit them. Well, it's gut check time. I taped some copper to the sides just so I can clamp it without needing three hands and I set up the 20 degree angle block. I squared up the steam chest against the back side of the jaw there on the vise which is all machined and I tapped it in until that was sitting square 
and then I double checked the angle block, make sure that was sitting good, and then tapped that back in, and I just went back and forth and back and forth until the angle block and the square were both solid. Now the Y position I can get by edge finding on the edges of the cylinder, but I can't do that for X because of the angle that it's sitting at. So that I lined up using the bolt hole that's at the number 12 position just by I with an end mill. And then I was able to use the DRO from there to locate the first feature, which is a machined flat that the steam port is drilled into. This flat is finished by side milling outwards into the bore and it effectively creates an elbow in the end of the steam channel so that the steam can get into the bore even if the recess of the cylinder head is sitting down in that area. Then it's just a matter of very carefully center drilling on the top of that flat and then drilling straight down until we break through into the steam port if all went to plan. You know, it's funny sometimes the things that I don't see in the moment and then see later when I'm editing the video. Did you see what happened there when I started drilling? The casting actually shifted in the vise. I didn't have it quite tight enough. I didn't notice that and luckily it still worked anyway, so that was just blind luck. Here on the Jello cam, you can see the glorious moment where the drill breaks through into the steam port perfectly as though it was in the drawing and somehow I actually did right. So I did the same thing three more times for all four steam channels and you can see the light coming through there. Those worked out really good. That was a very stressful operation, I'm not gonna lie. I was super happy when that worked out. Now comes an important moment in the life of every bore that will someday house a piston and that's honing. Cylinder honing is maybe one of the darker arts in the model steam community. If you look on the forums, people have a million different ways of doing it, usually involving some sort of homemade mandrel. But I found one suggestion that really appealed to me and that's these things here. These are cylinder hones for master brake cylinders and brake calipers on cars. So they're designed for cylinder bores in the kind of half inch to two inch range. Perfect for model steam. So this kit comes with a bunch of different sizes, each of which has a range of bore diameters and they are real cylinder hone stones on there. A specialty tool like this you'd expect to be expensive. This whole set was 25 bucks. I'll put a link to this down below. You can also buy them individually for 10 bucks each. I was really surprised by that and I thought, well, for that, I'll buy the set and I'll try them out. And I was really, really pleased with how these worked. So hashtag not sponsored, but uh, I've actually had good luck with these gear wrench branded tools. So uh, I'll link to this below. So let's talk a little bit about cylinder honing because this is one of those things where if you start looking on the forums and so on, everybody's an expert on it somehow and everybody has a different opinion and it's hard to actually find good information about what you need to do and why. The common wisdom on it is that you're supposed to have a 30 to 45 degree crosshatch pattern, but that's primarily for internal combustion engines. On steam engines, it seems to be that if you have cast iron rings, you want a crosshatch pattern, but for silicone or PTFE piston rings, you don't. A lot of people say the crosshatch is to help retain oil. A lot of other people say that's nonsense. Other people say it's for bedding in the rings. Other people say that's nonsense, so it's really hard to say. A lot of people also say that crosshatching is obsolete and it's not used on modern engines anymore, so I don't know. I did my best to synthesize all the information and what I decided to do was go for a smooth finish inside this bore because I have PTFE rings and uh, yeah, so that's what I did. And the master cylinder hone was a very good tool for doing that because it's designed for a smooth bore. This worked out really well. I'm very happy with the finish in there. It's just like glass to the touch. I think it's gonna work really well. That's my little cylinder casting. I hope you enjoyed the many complicated processes required to machine this thing. I had a lot of fun doing it and I learned a lot. Hope you enjoyed it too. If you like what I'm doing, throw me some love on Patreon and we'll see you next time.